This is Bloomberg Law. What does a prosecutor have to prove in order to get a RICO conviction? Tell us why the Solicitor General is sometimes referred to as the 10th Justice. Interviews with prominent attorneys and Bloomberg legal experts. That's Jennifer Kay for Bloomberg Law. Joining me is former federal prosecutor Robert Mintz. And analysis of important legal issues, cases, and headlines. Is the toughest hurdle for prosecutors proving Trump's intent? Alito took on Congress, saying Congress has no power to regulate the Supreme Court. Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. Welcome to a special best of edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. Ahead in this hour, we'll take a closer look at a case that could help determine which party controls the House after next year's election. Plus, FTX investors are suing celebrities, bankers, accountants, and lawyers. We have said that the burden that you're assuming of disentangling race uh, and politics in a situation like this is very, very difficult. The Chief Justice aptly described the problem in the case before the Supreme Court, the limits of partisan gerrymandering when it intersects with race. It's a case that could help determine which party controls the House after next year's election. A panel of three federal judges, after an eight-day trial, concluded that Republican lawmakers had engaged in unconstitutional racial gerrymandering in drawing South Carolina's first congressional district. But at oral arguments, the conservative justices expressed skepticism about that panel's decision. Here's Chief Justice John Roberts. We've never had a case where there's been no direct evidence, uh, no map, no strangely configured districts. very large amount of political evidence, uh, whether the district court chose to credit it uh, uh, or not. While the three liberal justices suggested the lower court had adequate evidence to conclude that South Carolina lawmakers improperly relied on race to get to its established target of 17 percent black voters in the district by shifting 30,000 black voters out of the district to hit that goal. Here's Justice Elena Kagan. You have two experts here, Raguso and Liu, who answer the exact question that is supposed to be answered in such a case. In other words, is this gerrymander based on politics, or is it a way to get to an ultimate goal, an ultimate political goal, but the gerrymandering is based on race? And what the two of them do is that they show that black Democrats are excluded from District 1 at a far greater percentage um, uh, than white Democrats are. Joining me is elections law expert Richard Brafald, a professor at Columbia Law School. So, Rich, tell us about the case and the main issue here. So this case is about a challenge to the redistricting of South Carolina's congressional plan in 2022 following the 2020 census. The major development affected uh, District 1, which is basically around Charleston, and it made the district more Republican by moving out a significant number of black voters into an adjacent black majority district. District 1 had been a Republican district, but in recent years it had been more closely contested. And in 2018, the Democrats actually won it for one term. 2020, the Republicans won it back, but very narrowly. So one of the things the legislature did in 2022 was change the composition to make it more Republican. And in so doing, it basically moved about 30,000 black voters from Charleston out of the district into an adjacent district. By the way, District 1 is the district that elects Nancy Mace, who had been previously considered a moderate, but since her district was changed, seems to have become more conservative, and she's one of the eight who voted to depose uh, Kevin McCarthy. So the question before the court, and it's a tough question, is whether the legislature was motivated by race or by party. You might say that in a state where race and party are so intertwined, that's an impossible question to answer because it's the same thing. But it's crucial because the Supreme Court has said that racial gerrymandering, that is to say the intentional movement of voters because of their race from one district into another, is unconstitutional. But partisan gerrymandering, as we all know since the Rucho decision in 2019, is non-justiciable. So it's okay for the state to engage in partisan gerrymandering. It's not okay for the state to engage in racial gerrymandering. South Carolina says it was both following traditional district lines but also had a partisan political purpose. What the lower court found was that actually the movement of voters did exhibit racial predominance. 
that given the way the voters were moved, which voters were targeted, and relying on the testimony of experts, they basically said that a disproportionate number of black Democrats relative to white Democrats were the ones who were moved, and therefore the, the district court was able to conclude that this was a racial gerrymander. That's what's being tested in the Supreme Court right now. Whether this is a racial or a partisan gerrymander, did the district court do it right? To what extent is the Supreme Court required to defer to the findings of the district court? And the district court's findings are really sort of factual. They basically made a determination based on the testimony of the person who wrote the South Carolina plan and of other experts that this was racially motivated. So one of the big issues before the court is what deference the district court finding was supposed to get. Normally, the standard that applies is something called clearly erroneous, which means the district court gets a lot of deference. But you saw some of the the more conservative justices pushing back on that here, saying that given the fact that the district court doesn't appear to have given trusted in the good faith of the legislature, and given some of the other challenges to the evidence in front of the district court, maybe the district court doesn't get the kind of deference that the clearly erroneous standard normally would give them. Okay, so let's take those That's a lot of issues stuff, one, one by one. So right. the three-judge federal panel referred to the revised map as effective bleaching of African-American voters out of the Charleston County portion of the district. And they came to that conclusion after an extensive eight-day trial featuring 42 witnesses and 652 exhibits. So doesn't the court usually defer to the factual findings of lower court judges? Yes. I mean, indeed, that is the standard. They're supposed to apply what's called the clearly erroneous standard. Not just was the district court right on balance, but as long as what the district court did was plausible, as long as they didn't do something which was clearly wrong as opposed to debatably wrong, they're supposed to defer. And you definitely heard the liberal justices emphasizing the importance of adhering to the clearly erroneous standard, that there was evidence to support what the district court found. And indeed, the um, United States came in The United States had not been a party to the case originally, but the Solicitor General's office came into the United States and actually emphasized the the importance of following the clearly erroneous standard. Chief Justice John Roberts said that the challengers of the map had no direct evidence that race had predominated in the decision-making process, just circumstantial evidence. This would be breaking new ground in our voting rights jurisprudence. Is that true? I mean, isn't circumstantial evidence enough? Right. They've often found circum- relied on circumstantial evidence. But his full statement was there was no direct evidence. He also said it was not an oddly shaped district. In a number of the early other cases in which the court has found racial gerrymandering, the district was oddly shaped. On this one, there was a big change in the district. People were moved around a lot, but the district itself didn't flunk any kind of test of odd shape, which is something the court has sometimes used. And the other issue that came up before the court was the fact that the plaintiffs had not presented an alternative map. Basically, the the question was, could the state have gotten its partisan goals without moving as many black voters around? And the question came up, should should the plaintiffs have been required to present an alternative map showing that the state could have made the district just as Republican without moving as many black voters? And there was a debate in the court as to whether the plaintiffs had to do that. And the precedent is that they don't have to. And indeed, Justice Kagan was quite strong on that because she'd actually written the case that said that, a case called Cooper, about five years ago. But nonetheless, the other justices sort of came back and said, well, maybe you didn't have to, but why didn't you? Why wouldn't that have helped your case if you could have shown that they could obtain their partisan goals without using race quite as much? I mean, it really went into the question, this difficulty of separating out race and party, In effect, the conservative justices were sort of creating, even though the prior case, Cooper had said there's no such requirement, you saw some of them basically kind of suggesting that either that there is or that there should be or that it's a problem when there isn't. Justice Kagan argued that the map makers wouldn't just have relied on the 2020 election results. She said this to the lawyer arguing for South Carolina. Your defense was, we didn't look at the racial data for this purpose. And what the lower court said was, I don't believe that. And later she also said they had not only the opportunity, it was sitting there on their computers, but the clear incentive to be looking at this race data. So explain what she was getting at there, and did you find it persuasive? So the couple of questions here are, one is, 
why would they why would the state bother using race when they could just use party and if their goal was to make the district more republican why not just use the party voting why why use race as a proxy when you actually have the party data one response to that is actually they had much more information on race than on on party they only had because of the way in which uh, kind of votes were counted in in uh, South Carolina they only had one election in which they had good party data and that was the 2020 presidential election and the at least the argument was that wasn't a good predictor because there had been more kind of uh, white crossover voting for Biden over Trump in that election so the plaintiffs argued and Justice Kagan suggested she agreed that in this case actually the state used the race data because the race data was more reliable better predictive value than the more limited party data. Her point was that it was on their computers, it was in their data, it was in their face, and they couldn't have been unaware of it. And indeed, at one point in the trial, the lead witness for South Carolina, the principal map maker, basically said, well, we weren't doing this for race, but yes, of course, we were aware of the racial data. And this is where the lower court basically concluded they really didn't believe him on that. Coming up next, we'll take a look at how the court might rule. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. You're listening to a special best of edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. I've been talking to Columbia Law School professor Richard Brafalt about Supreme Court arguments over whether it will reinstate a Republican-drawn congressional map in South Carolina after a lower court concluded that Republican lawmakers engaged in unconstitutional racial gerrymandering in drawing what is now a Republican-held district. Justice Samuel Alito was the most aggressive questioner of the validity of the lower court's decision. He posed nearly 40 questions to the NAACP's attorney. What was the thrust of his questions or problems? I think he basically said that this is politics and that the burden was heavy on the plaintiffs to show that it wasn't politics and that it was race. Much of this went into some of the details about what some of the experts testified to or their failure to address every point that the state raised. Some of the experts testified to whether or not the district complied with traditional districting criteria, but not whether or not it was partisan. Others focused on whether it was partisan or racial, but not on the districting criteria. So he felt that the expert testimony was inadequate to support the trial court's finding. He repeatedly raised the question about the alternative map. Even as he acknowledged that an alternative map was not required, he sort of found that the absence of an alternative map undermined the plaintiff's case. And again, he basically said that, in some sense, suggests that there was a heavier burden on the district court to prove that it was race and not party, given the way that the two were so tightly intertwined. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson kept stressing that the court relies on the factual findings of lower courts. And she said, it would be a dramatic shift to precedent if they overturn the trial court's findings. Is that true? Or if they find clear error, which Justice Clarence Thomas brought up right at the beginning, would it not be violative of precedent? Well, if they found clear error, it wouldn't be because the standard is clearly erroneous. The district court's findings are not immune from review, but it has to be clear error as opposed to whether or not it was debatable. In some sense, the the U.S. government, as I said, they came in on the side of the plaintiffs, on the side of the NAACP, and said, in effect, we think that the three-judge court could have gone either way. There was evidence to support either position, but the position that the district court found was reasonable, given the evidence they had. And so, and so that's why it's a, you should defer to them. I mean, one question that Justice Barrett raised suggests maybe whether the standard should be higher in a case involving a state legislature. Maybe there should be more more burden on the district court to show that the legislature wasn't acting in good faith. There's a kind of presumption that legislature, state legislatures act in good faith, so maybe there should be a higher legal burden on the district court. And you're right, Justice Jackson was very heavy on, on it, sort of sticking to the traditional role of the district court in finding the facts and the duty of appellate courts to defer. She had been a district court judge. It was kind of a civil procedure argument as much as anything else that the traditional role of the court is to see whether the lower court applied the law properly 
but to defer to their factual finding. The liberals were the, were the strongest on this about the importance of following this traditional judicial role of deferring to lower courts on their factual findings. Most legal commentators concluded after hearing the arguments that the conservative majority is going to uphold the Republican drawn map. Do you agree with that? There was certainly a lot of negative questioning, even from some of the so-called more moderate conservative justices. Remember, the most recent case involving race and voting, Allen versus Milligan, went off 5-4 with two of the conservatives, Roberts and Kavanaugh, joining the liberals. Roberts was clearly pretty skeptical about the lower court's finding in this case. He seemed less likely. Kavanaugh's questions were a little bit harder to read. I mean, some of it was, again, about the evidence, but some of it also seemed to indicate that he was thinking about what's the burden on the defendants, in this case, who are the appellants, to show that the district court was clearly wrong. I think it was certainly a tough argument for the NAACP defending the lower court's finding. I think if they have any chance, it's going to be to the extent that the court decides to rally around the idea that unless it's clearly erroneous, there should be deference to the lower court's finding. On the other hand, this is the court's first sort of race party intertwined case since Rucho four years ago when the court said that partisan gerrymandering is not unconstitutional, it's non-justiciable. So it's the first time that they will speak to the, how do you separate out race and party? And one could imagine they may want to shut down the idea that you could get around Rucho by reframing things around race. Now, the court in the past has said, even if there's a partisan factor, that the state can't use race as a proxy for party when it draws lines to favor a party. But one could imagine this is a case where the court might want to address the how do you disentangle race and party in a world in which racial gerrymandering is unconstitutional, but partisan gerrymandering is not. Explain why this case is different from the case you referred to, you know, the Alabama case, where it was surprising that the chief and Justice Kavanaugh sided with the liberals there. That case was really about whether or not the Alabama violated the Voting Rights Act. This one is whether or not South Carolina violated the Constitution. Although the result in Alabama will have a partisan consequence, there wasn't an argument that the state was doing it to help the Republicans. It wasn't really an argument about the intent of the state at all. That case, under the Voting Rights Act, the plaintiffs can win if they show disparate impact, if they show that the state drew lines in a way that had the effect of minimizing minority voting power. I mean, the thing is, in South Carolina, the district that was changed, District 1, was not going to be a majority-minority district. It was going to be a white-majority district either way, although for the larger black share of the voting population, it might have been a Democratic district, probably a white Democratic district. And that's sort of one of the differences here is that the court is somewhat sensitive to state actions that dilute minority voting power, but they don't care about state actions that favor one party over another. And so uh, the Alabama case was argued entirely around minority voting rights, although it turns out that if you increase minority voting power in that state, you were likely to get a result likely to have a partisan consequence. Here, it wasn't really a claim that minority votes were being diluted, just that voters were being moved around from one district to another. This case is the third time in two years that the court has heard arguments about states' congressional lines. And two other cases are advancing in the lower courts in Georgia and Louisiana that challenge maps under the Voting Rights Act. Is it that the court's precedent is not clear, or are these kinds of cases always challenged? Well, I think anything involving redistricting is going to be challenged. This case is different from the other ones. The other two cases, the one you mentioned, are Voting Rights Act challenges where the plaintiffs are arguing that the way the lines are drawn reduces the ability of black voters to elect the candidates of their choice in districts which might generate more minority representation. Louisiana, clearly so. In this one, again, there wasn't a claim that you would have created another black majority district. Interestingly, the court has tended to look at these things as to whether or not you know, they're going to be a sort of a majority minority or district where minority voters are likely to prevail, at least have the opportunity to prevail. They've been less sympathetic to arguments about, well, maybe minority voters will be more influential if they're a bigger share, but not nearly a majority. And so they haven't bought that argument. And so the voting rights arguments are always difficult because the plaintiffs have to show that there could have been another minority district 
that there is racially polarized voting and that under the totality of the circumstances, the setup is unfair to minority voters. And that's a tough standard to meet. And many people thought that the court just didn't seem that interested. The Allen case kind of maybe not revived that standard, but confirmed that that is still the standard. And so I think it's what's given some wind at the backs of the people bringing the challenges. Nonetheless, there's a slow slog through the courts. Thanks so much, Rich. That's Professor Richard Brafalt of Columbia Law School. Coming up next, we'll discuss lawsuits from FTX investors. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. You're listening to a special best of edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. I call it the wheel. Hmm. I don't think so. What does it do? It rules. Yeah, so does a bagel, okay? A bagel you can eat. One of the worst ideas I've ever heard. Like I was saying, it's FTX. It's a safe and easy way to get into crypto. Yeah, I don't think so. And I'm never wrong about this stuff. Never. Remember that Larry David commercial for FTX that had them laughing at the Super Bowl in 2022? And there was also Tom Brady touting FTX in commercials. Giselle Bündchen, Steph Curry, and Shaquille O'Neal, among others. Well, investors who claim they lost billions in the collapse of FTX are trying to pin the blame not just on Sam Bankman-Fried and his inner circle, but also on the celebrities who were paid to endorse it, as well as bankers, accountants, and lawyers who propped up the crypto exchange's legitimacy. Joining me is Braden Perry, a former federal regulatory enforcement attorney and a partner at Kenny Hertz Perry. So this is a class action lawsuit. Tell us about it. Yeah, so this is a lawsuit that was brought by uh, a number of individuals who were either investors or had some sort of financial interest in FTX. And uh, they brought it against a number of various entities, including celebrity endorsers, accountants, the actual members of FTX itself, as well as others. So it's a wide-ranging case that essentially boils down to FTX was falsely providing information to the public and the public somehow either invested or had some sort of financial interest in FTX and therefore were harmed. So let's start with the celebrities because that's where everyone starts. Right. (laughs) And those advertisements by Larry David and Tom Brady, the commercials were played at the beginning of SBF's trial. So what does the law require of celebrity endorsers? So generally the law requires not much. And what it requires is that the celebrity endorser knows what the product is and how it works. And two, that generally uh, there's some sort of disclaimer uh, ordinarily at the bottom of the advertisement or elsewhere that indicates celebrity endorser is a paid endorser for that product as well as the truthfulness. And so the endorser cannot provide information that's false or misleading to the public. So then does that mean that Jennifer Garner actually has to use the drugstore creams she claims she uses? Generally, that's the case. And so you'll see these advertisements with uh, certain restaurants where celebrities are at or certain products that they're using. And it, it's not an exclusive use. And so it can be a very high level. So if Jenner Garner has used a, a product that's been provided to her, she can certainly endorse that product. And so it's not a, a lifelong or a over-the-top type of use requirement. But generally, yeah, if, if a celebrity endorser is going to endorse a product, that celebrity endorser should be using that product. So does that mean that Tom Brady and Larry David and all the others should have been invested in FTX? Yeah, I don't know if they should have been invested in FTX. Obviously, they should have known what FTX is and what it does, and that would likely be their exchange of choice if they were going to be part of the crypto movement, not necessarily a needed part of that movement. That's why I'm wondering, when sophisticated investors didn't know about FTX and the government found out much later, how are celebrities supposed to know? Yeah, that's the big question. That's going to be the legal question is, what did the celebrities know? What influence did they have uh, on these investments? And that's really the crux of the, the legal argument. In this case, 
the class action is so wide with all the different entities associated with FTX. You know, the accountant, Stan Beckman frieds one of the defendants, all these celebrity so. endorsers, everyone is involved. And so there's going to be, from the defense side, lots of finger pointing as to who knew what and when and where and how. And so that's really going to be what the plans need to prove is whether or not these celebrity endorsers were intricate in this false and misleading product. Uh, Some of the lawyers for the celebrities are saying that the investors have no valid claim against them because the advertisements and sponsorships they were involved in didn't specifically encourage anyone to deposit money in FTX accounts. That seems weird uh, because that's what the ad is for, right? Also that they never pitched the accounts at issue in the SBF case. Do those sound like typical defenses? They sound like typical defenses. Whether or not they will be uh, successful is, is another story. The defense teams have several different lines of defense. As you mentioned, you know they weren't specific to the actual accounts. They didn't provide terms or conditions of the accounts. They weren't detailing what the accounts could or could not do. And so that's a general defense to, to the claims. However, they knew or should have known that there was misleading information by not providing some of that information about these accounts, and that can be counterproductive to their case. Also, if I'm sitting on the defense table and I see that the the main group, the head of FTX, has been convicted of crimes, I'm certainly pointing to that, saying, hey, these people were committing crimes, were victims just as much as you were. Yeah, so the Sam Bankman freed conviction and the guilty pleas of his inner circle should be helpful to the defendants here. Now, some of the other targets of the lawsuit are professional advisors ranging from an accounting firm, investment firm, and a bank. Those seem like more reasonable defendants to me. Yeah, and and they should be. And ordinarily when you find, and you'll look at the past history of massive frauds in finance, Madoff is the best picture of that. There is still ongoing litigation involving accountants, uh, professional individuals who had some part of his scheme. That's the case here. You know, obviously the accountants, the investment firms, all of these pieces were, were part of the ongoing massive dollars that FTX was bringing in and maintaining during its lifetime. And those are the traditional defendants you'd see. Celebrity endorsers, frankly, you don't see that often. And I think that, you know, obviously there have been a group that have settled uh, just because likely they didn't want to be bothered with the litigation nor part of the litigation. And there's a, a valid reason to settle and get out. But I think the ones that are still in there have uh, relatively valid defenses that, one, they were victims too, and two, that their endorsements had no no input on what the actual underlying fraud of FTX was about. Last year, a federal judge dismissed a lawsuit from investors that accused Kim Kardashian, boxer Floyd Mayweather, and others of endorsing a cryptocurrency known as Ethereum Max. So, I mean, that could happen here, but Is there a lot of pressure on the celebrities to settle? So it's a big gamble, and litigation in the end is a gamble. You can spend a lot of money uh, trying to defend yourself and either get dismissed through summary judgment, through motion to dismiss, through other type of non-trial activity, and it's still, at the end of the day, going to cost you money. And so there's a lot of of times and you know when i'm i'm dealing with litigation and my clients i talk to them about uh, the financial aspects of taking something to trial you know what what will that cost number one and what is the actual potential cost from it an adverse decision at trial and a lot of times you know you find a a middle ground with the other side from a litigation standpoint where uh, it makes more sense to settle and move on um, as opposed to to trying to defend yourself months and months down the road. It takes an emotional toll. It takes a financial toll. Litigation is not fun. And uh, many times people Not even will, for lawyers? Not e- well, some of these lawyers, I think, are probably having a good time with this. But it's certainly, from a defendant or plaintiff standpoint, there's a lot that goes into it. And it's certainly, you know, when, when I have large cases that involve a long time of litigation, 
it's not easy on on either defendants or plaintiffs. It, it takes a lot of emotional toll from individuals when you're dealing with litigation day in and day out. It certainly does, not to mention the costs of litigation. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, I'll continue my conversation with former federal regulatory enforcement attorney Braden Perry. Will the case involving FTX be more complicated to unwind than the Madoff case was? And attorneys looking for legal research? Whether you're an in-house counsel or in private practice, Bloomberg Law gives you the edge with the latest in AI-powered legal analytics, business insights, and workflow tools. With guidance from our experts, you'll grasp the latest trends in the legal industry, helping you achieve better results. For the practice of law, the business of law, the future of law, visit BloombergLaw.com. This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. You're listening to a special best of edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. I've been talking to Braden Perry, a former regulatory enforcement attorney, about the FTX investors' lawsuits. As you mentioned, Bernie Madoff, the investor suits played out for well over a decade, still some playing out. Do you think the SBF case is even more complicated to unwind than the Madoff? Yeah, I do. I, you know, we've been talking strictly about this. This one plaintiff case involves a number of celebrity endorsers. You have to remember that the criminal case is essentially over. There will be appeals. There will be other issues in this, although I don't think many of those appeal issues. He was convicted. I think he'll be sentenced. I don't think any appeals will be successful. Uh, then you got the regulatory action. So you got the CFTC, you got the SEC. Ordinarily, within these parallel criminal cases, those cases likely will be settled because there's not much else to go after. The big issue is going to be bankruptcy receiverships in the different jurisdictions and trying to claw back as much of this lost money as possible to provide to investors. So that's going to be the main focus for the next decade is the receivership action to claw back all this individual funds from all these various entities. And then you'll have these civil cases that are trying to find those that may not have exposure otherwise. So these celebrity endorsers, those types of things. And so it's going to be complicated. And the fact that that crypto wasn't regulated like Madoff's Ponzi scheme was. There's no central regulator. You got the SEC, you got the CFTC that are part of this. But unlike Madoff, where you could point directly at the SEC, there's really no nexus of jurisdiction between anyone. So it's going to take a long time. You know, the FTX had offices all over the place. There's multiple jurisdictions. It will take a while to unwind what this has become, and it could be could be longer than what Madoff looked at. And at the sentencing of Sam Bankman-Fried and the three people who flipped, will the judge order restitution? The way it generally works when it comes to parallel criminal slash regulatory slash liquidation proceedings is anything the government gets. And so as part of the sentencing for for Sam Bankman-Fried, for Carolyn Ellison, for Wang, for all of these individuals, there'll be a restitution element as their sentence. And that will go into the bucket of the receiver. So uh, you'll likely see any ill-gotten gains these individuals received will be part of that restitution order under the sentencing that will flow uh, into the receivership action that will be part of that bucket to provide to investors. So yeah, they will likely have large restitution positions as part of their sentencing. Are there more of these class action lawsuits, or has this one been certified as a class, do you know? When it comes to all of these different actions, um, there's lots of priority. And uh, the priority, number one, was the criminal case. And while criminal case is ongoing, generally all the civil cases are stayed due to a number of different evidentiary issues, issues with, with certain constitutional rights, those types of things. That's the case in the Florida action. At this point in time, there's been ongoing discovery about that class action. There's not been a decision to certify the class action as of yet, but I do know that there's a number of different motions, a number of different uh, procedural elements that have been put on hold while the criminal case was ongoing. Uh, Now that the criminal case is over, I think all of these courts are going to get back in full gear to be addressing all of these issues now. I mean, there's going to be a number of evidentiary issues from the trial. The vast 
government investigation could be a treasure trove of information for the plaintiffs when it comes to these types of things. And so the courts are now going to have to face that issue and begin moving again procedurally on these cases. Obviously, these are interesting times that we live in when it comes to crypto, and, and I think this is a another indication that at some point there needs to be some sort of regulation to ensure that this doesn't happen again. But it's been interesting in the process, and I think uh, you know, several years ago looking at this, you wouldn't think that uh, Sam Batman Freed, who had provided money to politicians, to businesses, I mean, the FTX had its name on every umpire's <laughs> jersey in Major League Baseball, so you wouldn't have thought of that. And now we're here. So it's been an interesting time, and I think it will be certainly interesting for the next few years and more in seeing how this all plays out. A long road ahead. Thanks so much, Braden. That's Braden Perry of Kenny Hertz Perry. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.